actually I did go through, but I uh, still did not find X-ray wise how uh, we can differentiate. Um, like if, if there is an appearance of uh, periosteal reaction in the absence okay. of question and all, then how exactly to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, uh, two things happen. One is the periosteal reaction with infection is generally associated with osteolytic areas. Then it is too, it is not solid. With healing, generally it becomes more and more solid. So at one go, it is difficult to say whether it is healing or infection. You need to trace these x-rays serially. And need to compare three, four things. One is the cortex. Second is the lytic areas. Then the periosteal reaction and the fracture site. All that needs to be compared from in serially. Uh, yes, sir. So I think the ma major thing which I was uh, not keeping in mind was the lytic areas. And typically when we have a fracture with an implant in situ, more or yes. less, most of the time we don't see any sequestrum. It's only by the appearance of osteopenia that we will indirectly know. So Correct. Correct. So that osteolytic areas are important. Dr. Menon, will you share the uh, PPT? Yeah, I'll do that. This is what Dr. Aisha has sent to me. Yes. So we'll discuss the first case. If you could just explain, uh, Aditi, you just present yeah. it and let her give her inputs. Yeah. So we I'll go, go ahead till, till the slide she has given her inputs. Correct. So this was a 60 year old male diabetic presented with a discharging sinus on the right leg. The x-rays showed uh, segmental fractures fixed with two separate bones. And uh, there was some periosteal reaction at both ends, proximally and distally. If you could look closely, the distal was more solid and the proximal periosteal reaction was more fluffy and not as solid as the distal one. So tracing the old x-rays, uh, the patient had a road traffic accident six months prior to presentation to us. Had a segmental fracture which was plated. Approximately, some some kind of bone substitute was used, and was probably fixed in a recurve atom uh, at the proximal fracture site. So this was at presentation six months after the fixation with a discharging sinus. Multiple oral and IV antibiotics were given, but the sinus persisted. The problems at presentation were that the patient was diabetic. There was a discharging sinus, non-union at the proximal one third. Probably uniting this area, there was a minimal recovery. With the multiple scars and the sinus, the skin was adherent and it was not an ideal skin condition for bone healing. And uh, this is a slide where Dr. Aisha has given her in. Yeah, if you could explain uh, the second point. Second and second point. Yes, sir. So, sir, uh, uh, since I do not know how uh, how far the patient has arrived from what uh, has he planned for admission or just uh, is he ready to go and all. So, uh, we if you plan, we should admit the patient anyhow. And uh, if the patient has been on antibiotics, uh, then ideally we should stop for two weeks as per what has been uh, discussed in earlier classes and send the patient back home. But if that is not the case, because it has mentioned that patient has been on multiple antibiotics, assuming that antibiotics are not going on currently uh, so we can uh, simply admit the patient and uh, take a I, I would uh, uh, plan to take a swab in the ward after sterilizing the surrounding skin with some alcoholic solution and then plan for operative intervention uh, inside the operate and keeping in mind that uh, I'll be taking further uh, uh, deep tissue swabs inside the OT uh, also and inside the OT uh, uh, may I just interrupt you? Yes, sir. Yeah, any reason why you would like to take swab in the wards before surgery? Sir, actually, I, I feel, sir, uh, there won't be any harm in taking the ward and uh, in taking the uh, swab in the ward itself because um, even if we do get contaminants, uh, we can get some sample and uh, like. 
um, like we can get some culture uh, and start antibiotics like likewise so i think it's just uh, not too much uh, uh, on the uh, oper- uh, on the management point as uh, just a, a habitual basis sir. okay uh, generally it's been accepted world over that you should not take swab from the sinus reason is the skin contaminants are there and you would really miss the the uh, actual offending microbes so especially if you are operating then it is best that the swab is taken in the theater that was one point i i thought i would like to discuss sir if you are sanitizing the surrounding skin sir uh, would that uh, would not that reduce contaminants in the skin see there is a sinus correct which is lined by epithelium correct yes sir so those microbes certainly infect even the deep part and they would okay. contaminate plus swab per se are not a good medium for getting swabs for culture it is best to collect tissue as well as pus from deep inside hmm? so generally all as i said world over people have stopped using swabs dr menon quoted a paper where the discrepancy between swabs and deep culture is significant just about 22% concordance just 22% and it's a recent paper i think 2017 paper if i am not mistaken aditya so uh, we will discuss this case further uh, now uh, i'll start sharing my presentation but thank you very much for giving inputs please continue to do that i'll definitely send cases much earlier next time onwards so that all of you please continue to give your inputs and aisha it is likely that in your setup this is the norm that's fine but uh, this is just a suggestion there is nothing right or wrong in surgery medicine yes aditya can you stop sharing i have i have stopped sharing so friends welcome to the fifth module and we would be discussing the post surgical infection or post osteosynthesis infection part 2 the definition of infection is often assumed to be understood but it is seldom provided and most important can we objectively assess the wounds it is known that primary surgeon underestimates second opinion surgeon overestimates the situation becomes challenging if you have diagnosed infection explored debrided and the wound healing is disturbed after that then how do you quantify the wound so this is an elderly lady presented at 3 weeks and 4 days she had a right intertrochanteric fracture this is the history we have traced uh, non diabetic hypertensive she has recurrent uti and she came up with an open incision with foul smelling discharge raise crp and esr she was treated with short tfn somewhere else and this is what she the relatives send these images you can see that's the opened wound and this is the video they shared this was debrided in the wards by another surgeon and when she came in there was a foul smelling discharge we did, did an mri which showed signal abnormalities at the nail entry point as well as at the helical blade entry point so considering all this she was already on antibiotics 
So considering all this, we have defined infection because there is a confirmatory criteria. There is a sinus. Also, there are suggestive criteria, local and systemic redness and raised ESR, CRP. So no doubt she needs surgical exploration, correct? Because we have already diagnosed fracture-related infection. This we discussed last time. And when she presented at about four weeks, naturally, we had to salvage infection and we had to explore. So what is the plan? This is an early infection. The fixation is stable because she was able to walk comfortably. The x-ray also was suggestive that the, the fixation is absolutely stable. We should be able to close. The pathogen is unknown. Now, how do we open? We need to excise the entire incision from nail entry to distal locking screw. One long incision. And the idea is to excise all previous incisions. So this is where you are. That's the nail entry side. That's the, uh, the uh, helical blade side. And we could get this material. Histopathology was suggestive of infection, but culture again was negative. So she was put, continued on the present tazobactam. Unfortunately, this is how she presented on 12th day. You can see the skin is necrotic. There's wound dehiscence, minimal serous discharge, but no pain, redness, and warmth. She was febrile. ESR CRP had distinctly reduced. So question is whether it is a superficial wound or a deep wound, whether we should re-explore again. Now, the, now I am a primary surgeon. I underestimate. We felt that there was no redness. You can see there was no redness at all. It was only superficial skin. We excised this. continued dressing twice a day, monitored her very carefully, clinically as well as hematologically, and she continued to improve. You can see at six weeks, the skin has started healing. At eight weeks, she has started healing. X-ray is very satisfactory. This is 10 weeks post-debrayment. Wound has almost come up. And this is at four months post-operative, post-debrayment. She has completely healed. The problem is, Here, after debridement, there was a superficial skin necrosis. It was a very challenging situation to decide whether to re-explore or not to re-explore. But we had debrided her once, got rid of biofilm. She was on anticipated antibiotics. We had monitored her very carefully, clinically. She was improving. And we were sure that the deep tissues or the deep fascia was intact. So it was a difficult decision, but we could salvage this fixation as well as we did not have to re-explore after first deployment. So the, it is challenging to classify infection, quantify infection, and compare infected wounds. Is there any system by which we can do all this? So this is a very nice paper. I'll share this with you. Can you measure infection? This is a paper from a, a orthopedic institute in United States. And they analyzed more than 7,000 surgical wounds prospectively. May 2000 to 2008, there was a wound surveillance program and any operative wound, any wound where incision was made by the surgeon were included. Traumatic wounds were not included. In the sense, suppose a patient had an open fracture and then he was operated with another incision. The other incision was assessed, not the open fracture. And this is how they presented. And there, were, there, were, there are three definitions three separate definitions called CDC definition, United Center, US Center for Disease Control, 
the United Kingdom Nosocomial Infection Surveillance Scheme and the Asepsis System. Each definition was used in this every patient and they compared whether using these three definitions, the percentage of infection remains same or if it differs. So CDC, what is CDC definition? It is superficial infection and deep infection. Superficial infection, if it involves only skin and superficial tissue, while deep infection, it's surgical site and involves deep infection, deep tissue. And these are the various criteria of CDC. I'm going to share this with you. While NINSS infection is almost similar to CDC, but in CDC, there is a very funny uh, criteria, and that is diagnosis by a surgeon or physician, diagnosis by a surgeon or physician. So that has been taken out in this definition. The real scoring system, a quantitative scoring system is a sepsis. This way we could compare our patient preoperatively and postoperatively or pre-debridement and post-debridement. A is additional treatment. S is serous discharge. E is erythema. P is purulent exudate. S is separation of deep tissues. I is isolation of bacteria. S is stay as an inpatient. And this asepsis stands for all these. Every uh, alphabet has been given points, like antibiotics, 10 points, drainage of pus under local anesthesia, 5 points, debridement under general anesthesia, 10 points, so on and so forth. And these points depend these points like serous discharge, erythema, purulent exudate, separation of deep tissues. Again, they are from zero to five, dependent on percent involvement of the wound. Like if it is 20%, then it is one point. If it is 35%, it is two points, so on and so forth. And therefore, you can actually objectively assess the wound and compare. It is complicated, of course, more time consuming. And the paper states that it takes about an hour to collect data and calculate the sepsis score. But finally, what they found was with asepsis, the percentage of infection was 8.7%. With NMIS, NINIS, it was 11%. And with CDC, it was 15%, as high as 15%. So what they concluded, is there is no reliable definition and these dedicated programs with proper follow-up result in apparently high rates of infection being reported. So finally, it is the surgeon who decides whether it is infected or not. It is very, very difficult to objectively assess the infection rate. And therefore, they said a need for a single accurate and reproducible definition is needed. Now, in our patient, Initially, it was 22%, and after debridement, it came down to 12%. And therefore, as I said, this is all in hindsight, but after debridement, we felt that this is just disturbance of healing, and possibly we will be able to salvage this fixation. After this paper, orthopedic surgeon decided that we need to define infection, and therefore, this definition was modified as I have already discussed. So finally, surgery should be in, performed before confirmatory criteria appear. You need not diagnose infection to operate. You should operate on suspicion. Earlier you operate, earlier you debride, better are the chances of salvaging infection. So debridement and culture-specific antibiotics are foundation for salvage of infection till fracture union. A confusing uh, uh, discussion, but if you read this paper, you will be you will understand that it is very very difficult to decide or define infection 
but explore before you stamp a case as infection. Any questions? I think we'll go ahead with the first case and then we will discuss together. Okay. I'll go ahead with the yeah. first case. The first case that we're going to discuss today is an infected non-union of the tibia. Now, as, as surgeons, the minute we see an infected non-union in our OPD or in the ward or referred to us, we, we start thinking on multiple things. I mean, it's a rapid thought process, at least which goes to my mind. I start thinking on the extent of infection, what is the extent of soft tissue or bony infection, whether it's across the entire plate, limited to a certain segment, what kind of surgical procedures will be required? Will it be just one? Will it be multiple stage procedures with implant removal, maybe local antibiotics, bone grafting at some stage, or maybe bone transport with a ring later? What about the need for plastic surgery? By and large, infected non-unions come with very poor soft tissue cover with the exposed implant. So will we be able to get a primary cover after a debridement or will we need the help of a plastic surgeon, maybe negative pressure wound therapy? And ultimately, for that infected non-union to unite, we require some fixation strategy. Can we do an internal fixation in the presence of an infection or do we have to, will we have to rely on external fixation? Now, there are so many things that go through, go through our mind, but ultimately when we see such a patient, and after having thought of all of this, we must provide, be able to provide the patient and the relatives with a roadmap as to how we can take them from a stage of infected non-union to infection, remission, as well as union. It's not a uni united fracture with a persistent sinus or we are rid of the infection, but a frank non-union exists. So we need a combination of the both and that is what we must be able to convey to our patients in a planned manner. How do we come up with that plan? Whenever we are faced with an infected non-union, we start off with an infected non-union, with an infected envelope. Our first goal is to create an uninfected envelope. That is after getting rid of the infected bone, which we've been dis discussing for so many weeks, getting rid of the infected soft tissue, all the adherent scars and sinuses. And having done our debridement, we reach, we create an uninfected envelope. And then we come up with strategies during this process to bridge the soft tissue as well as bony defect. Now, for that, we've been saying this time and again, we need a multi-pronged approach of debridement, implant removal, soft tissue cover, appropriate antibiotics after the deep tissue cultures, stabilization. It obviously requires a team. And through this case, we'll highlight all of these factors again and again. This was a 60-year-old male, the same case which we discussed at the beginning of this session uh, with a discharging sinus on the right leg. Patient had a segmental fracture of the tibia with placed in situ with a slight recovatum. The old x-ray showed a segmental fracture six months back, plated by the primary surgeon with artificial bone graft and there was one loose piece of bone lying there. Patient had a surgical site infection, multiple antibiotics were given, oral, IV, but there was no debridement done. The discharging sinus persisted. The patient came to us at this stage with a non-union at the proximal site and probably uniting fracture distally because the infection was or the discharging sinus was clearly at the proximal site. And the skin, overlying skin was completely adherent because of the previous scars on the sinus. We come back to our multi pronged approach, the first of which would be radical debridement. Again, excising all the scars, sinuses. I can't keep repeating this enough because this is the most important part in creating the uninfected envelope. Getting rid of the necrotic tissue, excising the necrotic bone, all the biofilm under the implant in the medullary canal must be removed. We have discussed in the previous session that if the patient is generally comes after four to, four to six weeks, by then the biofilm is already uh, established under the implant and within the medullary canal. So retaining this implant is out of question. The plate must be removed. Only then will we get access to the medullary canal and the deep tissue samples can be collected. So let's understand the problems at hand in this patient through a very simple animation that uh, Agashya sir has made. Now, this is the fracture fixed with a plate and the biofilm is over it. By now we know that at six months, the biofilm is clearly established and it keeps discharging bacteria every now and then. So they're sessile in the biofilm, they multiply 
and then suddenly they burst out and the patient has acute symptoms swelling redness maybe fever and the minute it forms a discharging sinus all that purulent material comes out inflammatory material comes out and again patient settles and then the process starts again so the patient has a biofilm there's a sinus uh, discharging into the skin there's a biofilm over the plate there's a biofilm under the plate along the screw holes and at the fracture site as well as in the medullary canal so biofilm exists in all of these places not just above the implant so you must first excise the previous scars and the sinus tract expose the slimy layer of the biofilm on top of the implant get rid of that then we expose the plate remove the plate and clean the under surface of the plate as well as the screw hole and the non union site the access of which we can get only after implant finishing and then after creating this uninfected envelope with defects in the bony and soft tissue we must create we must bridge these defects with a flap or a skin graft i mean depending on the area and the site exposed and devise strategies to fix it that is after creating a non united fracture without a discharging sign so this is how we manage this patient the incision as we have been showing in various cases they are extensile including all the previous scars and sinuses we have included the distal scar as well or look clinically there were no indications of infection we we want to see that area explore it and be sure that there is no infection there so the entire scar and sinus was excised and mass the minute we exposed that we could see this dirty granulation tissue on top of the plate some of the screws were loose uh, the threads of the screws that come off clearly showed that the the screws practically walked out clearly showed that the fixation proximally was unstable the minute we removed the proximal plate the biofilm under the plate which is grayish brown could be clearly seen the screw holes were full of muck they have to be scraped out with small size scoops which must be available in our armor materium pus was seen at the non union site and all these were multiple samples one was a sample above the plate second sample under the plate third from the non union site which we can then club together as we discussed and then maybe two appropriate samples but initially we separate them out as each individual sample and label them necrotic bone was excised this is the amount of tissue that was removed on the left bottom we can see the image of the multi six containers that were labeled and then we finally club them into two this is fracture is clearly stable uh, the screw holes were clean so it shows that if the fixation is stable and there is no infection there is not necessary that we have to go and open that fixation although it is in the same bone infection was clearly localized to the proximal fracture site which we debrided excised and created a gap now question is you see this defect is a massive defect on the tibia it is impossible to close this so we pack the uh, wound made sure that there is no bleeding the next thought process is we use a negative pressure wound therapy that's back and then plan for some kind of uh, local or pre flap so this is the vac foam that was applied this is the radiograph after the first surgery clearly showing the defect proximally distally it was completely stable multiple cultures were sent we get in the microbiology and the infection we seen they saw the patient pre operatively as well and uh, we start we start tracing the reports and start thinking on the lines of how we stabilize this a lot of times before a debridement we are not able to come to conclusion as to what will be the ideal fixation strategy by now here we know that the non union site proximally will have to be stabilized with an external fixator initially culture group methicillin sensitive staph aureus again to repeat cefoxidin cream was negative oxacillin was sensitive so this is an mssa simple first generation cephalosporin called cefazolin was used given for 2 weeks if that is not available which is not in a lot of places cefiroxim which is a second generation super cef one of the brands can also be used followed by oral cefalexin for for 4 weeks then we use local antibiotic feeds now the proximal and distal scars could be easily approximated without any tension so the middle segment where we done the macro excision was clearly uh, not a not uh, approx we could not approximate it so there is something where we would need a flap especially that came on the non union side and having a flap at the non union side always an ample vascularity in improves results so we put stimulan beads with cefiroxim in the proximal and distal canal so that gave us a good spread of antibiotics there 
partial closure was done, this defect was covered with wax and external fixator was applied to stabilize the fracture. We can see these x-rays here showing stimulant beads proximally and distally and a hybrid external fixator. Uh, that is, it should be pins are never in one line. So we're able to get the proper alignment with this fixator, create a proximal segment, distal segment, and then fix it with a rod to rod clamp. Next stage was the closure with a local facial cutaneous flap. Uh, Morisa did that flap. And at the same stage, we use the masculine technique. That is, we missed, mixed PMMA with vancomycin. Here, we had to use vancomycin because cephalosporins are heat labile, thermolabile. So they, they would uh, disintegrate when this exothermic reaction happens. So vancomycin was used. A facial cutaneous flap was done. And this is how we went from an infected non union to creating an uninfected envelope. So this is four weeks after the index debridement, after our debridement, the bone gap was filled with PMMA antibiotic cement and the flap had completely healed. ESR CRP had normalized. There were no clinical signs of infection. We had bridged the soft tissue. Now came the question of bridging the bone defect. Since we had put in the bone cement as a masculine, the routine thinking is we go in again, remove the masculine block, put in iliac crest bone graft. This was done at three months post-operative. We took long iliac crest grafts and we make sure that these grafts are slightly longer than the defect so that they auto fit and must be auto stable. Any loose piece of bone graft will never consolidate. It has to be snugly fit such that they don't move at all and give a thorough wash after the bone grafting. So any loose, loose pieces will come out. Our general thinking is if you give a wash, the loose pieces, the pieces might uh, come out. So if a piece comes out with a wash, that means it's not stable and it will never consolidate. In fact, it will create a sequestration somewhere down the line. So this was the X-ray at six months, clearly showing good bridging posteriorly. Went on to hypertrophy and consolidate at eight months. This is when the fixator was removed. This is the one-year follow-up and three years. You can clearly see how on the lateral view, how the defect kept on filling from posterior to anterior. And the flap was healthy, no signs of recurrence. The patient has a complete range of movement and is walking without any support. So radical debridement with the surgical knife cannot be substituted with antibiotics. Here, this patient was given multiple antibiotics before presentation. The debridement followed by targeted antibiotics, reconstruction, stabilization can give extremely good outcomes. We can have various, as, as orthopedic surgeons, we're trained to, see, to, to think about stabilization, fracture fixation. Then we start thinking about antibiotics and what soft tissue cover. The most important is the first step of radical debridement and implant removal, and everything else follows after that. So let's not forget our surgical knife. That is the most crucial step in any debridement, in any infected case. Thank you. If we can take a couple of questions, if there are any, uh, and Agashya sir will be taking the next talk. Uh, so you're muted, we can't hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can. We can. Okay. So you have followed everything. You have explored, you have debrided, you have removed the implant. In spite of that, if the infection persists, then it is a very challenging situation because socially it becomes difficult to explain the reason. Medically, tons of antibiotics would be given. So chances of negative culture would be high. And finally, the financial. Patient is all about all, uh, always going to ask you, doctor, you have done all this. Now why have I why should I spend so much? So surgically, we need to think why the infection has not settled. Therefore, we need to plan properly the exploration and incision again. 
टाइमिंग ऑफ एक्सप्लोरेशन सॉफ्ट टिश्यू डिफिशियंसी एंड ऑफकोर्स कलेक्टिंग सैंपल एंड वॉट ऑल टेस्ट टू बी डन Generally, it is considered that moment you take out the implant, the infection would settle. And the commonest reason is you have done a mepo, infection has occurred. You use the same incisions and take out the implant. That is one of the commonest reasons why this happens. So, discussing one case, this was a middle-aged man presented with discharging sinuses of right leg. for 5 months 5 months there was a discharging sinus multiple discharging sinuses he had fractured tibia for which surgery was done a year ago so tracing history he had closed fracture lower third tibia he was treated with mepo plating developed early surgical site infection he was put on antibiotics for quite some time and at 3 months the surgeon he went to another surgeon who felt i think we should remove the implant so he used the same incisions and took out the implant the culture was pseudomonas but in spite of appropriate antibiotics his discharge were persistent he developed discharging sinuses and this is when he presented to us he didn't have much pain funnily he said there are discharging sinuses but not much pain so this is how he was you can see there was a proximal incision a distal incision and in between are multiple sinuses the x ray shows clearly non union ct scan also shows a distinct gap the mri you can see there is a altered or bright signals at the non union site as well as a proximal screw site so the pre op planning we involved an infectious disease specialist they said previous culture was pseudomonas in spite of that the infection has not settled so there is something more to it he doesn't have much pain so they kept thinking that this is very very likely to be non tubercle mycobacteria orthopedically we decided we must have an extensile incision incorporating scars and sinuses we need to scrape the medullary cavity and proximally and distally the abnormal signal sites need to be addressed so if you do surgery again going back to our biofilm why should you not explore using the same incisions so you do surgery by mepo and if it gets infected the entire plate gets covered by biofilm entire plate and very often fracture site so the film is in sinuses the skin over the plate under the plate in the screw holes at fracture site medullary cavity everywhere there is going to be a biofilm but if you do the plate removal by only mepo all these areas will still contain biofilm you will not be able to remove that biofilm and therefore significant biofilm will remain inside and the infection would not come under control so osteosynthesis may be by mepo implant removal has to be always full open so our incision was a complete incision the entire skin deep fascia or periosteum everything was taken out biofilm over the tibia was excised you can see the both the canals canals on both the sides we have put in artery just to show that we have scooped that area and we debrided it but there was no frank exuberant infection of course there was dirty granulation tissue but not a frank purulent discharge but moment we came to the proximal screw site there was a granulation tissue here i must mention that one of our junior most person after we have done a good job he said sir you have not explored the proximal suicide that is why always we always mention his name dr sandeep belar who was instrumental in getting appropriate culture so we excise that and here you can see there is a big defect we put in vac now the question was 
how do we get a good soft tissue cover and what kind of fixation do we do now the infection did not appear florid therefore we thought that we might be able to use internal fixation either a plate or a nail and therefore the plastic surgeon felt that we must do a, a microvascular flap so that this when we are closing we realized that the distal incision was a little difficult to be closed so he said i we will do a micro flap that is a lateral thigh micro flap so he did a micro flap now before that there was lack of exuberant infection there was previous surgery no response to targeted antibiotics and therefore the thinking of id team and our thinking also this is very likely to be a typical mycobacteria so afb was negative gene expert was negative but histopathology was highly suggestive of mycobacterial etiology kgs granulomas suggestive of mycobacterial etiology so it is most unlikely to be a tuberculous mycobacterium tuberculosis because this is post surgery this is most unlikely to be mycobacterium tuberculosis so therefore these cultures take almost 6 weeks whether it is tuberculosis or ntm and therefore we decided to put in stimulan beads with antibiotics and get a good cover so we put vanco and colistin because his previous culture was pseudomonas so we decided to put that post operatively empirically he was put on ntm treatment that is amikacin linozid and clarithromycin our classical treatment for mtb generally generally does not work with ntm unfortunately unfortunately we had a big big setback you can see the micro flap got necrosed in 5 to 6 days time so we are in big trouble we have done a debridement we have used a huge created a huge defect because we wanted very very clean tissues we have done a micro flap which was yes spent lot of time patient spent lot of money and now we have we are back to square number 1 so again we debrided excise that necrotic bone piece used this uh cleanse choice vac is very very useful it grows this granulation tissue uh, improves within a matter of few days and then the plastic surgeon did a local facio cutaneous flap over fracture site we did a skin graft proximal and distally and at the end we had a good soft tissue cover so at least one step taken rather two steps taken we have debrided well we have got a, a histopathology evidence of my, mycobacterial tissues and we have a cover this is him at about 3 weeks and at 6 weeks we had another bad news ntm but a slow growing ntm this was not a rapid growing ntm the importance of this is you cannot do sensitivity for slow growing ntm so we have some good things and bad things we have an uninfected envelope we have identified the bacteria we thought we can give appropriate antibiotics and then nature will help us but the id people said that these bugs are extremely troublesome we cannot judge antibiotic sensitivity you cannot think of any any implant inside avoid any implant inside you all this was ruled out implants were ruled out they said try and avoid that so uh, what was the choice for us choice was these are the non tubercle bacteria they were treated with rifampicin ethambutol and clarithromycin avoid any hardware 
So we were not keen on any intervention. We have a good uninfected envelope. So we thought we will see if we can get whether nature helps us, whether some bone forms posteriorly. So we gave him a PTB at two weeks, two months, you can see he started forming bone posteriorly. He became very stable. In just two months time with PTB, he became very, very stable. At that time, we decided that we will go ahead, open the flap, 50% flap was opened. As uh, Dr. Menon said, whenever you do bone graft, the bone grafts also should give you some support. You should pack the grafts in such a way that they give support. Make a slot proximally and distally. Take out tricortical graft. Here you can see the grafts are punched inside. They themselves give support. And we cover, closed the flap. This is him uh, after surgery. This is a two months graft is uh, healing. This is at four months, good healing. This is nine months since our index surgery is partial weight bearing. That's the clinical image. This is pretty good healing, real good consolidation. Patient is walking full weight bearing. That seven months post bone grafting and that's the clinical thing. So to, to conclude friends, especially in such cases, in fact, in every case, send TB culture, ask for extended incubation if history and findings are suggestive of a chronic infection like this. Inputs, whenever possible, take input, input from ID team. Free flap is an excellent choice, but it has its own downside. So we as orthopedic surgeons should learn local flaps. There are many, many orthopedic surgeons who have picked up these local flaps very, very well. And they work, work extremely well to create a good uninfected soft tissue envelope. At every opportunity, send samples. And as I said, flap is important. And whenever you are in trouble, think coolly. Like here, we had a complete flap necrosis. So think coolly what is plan B and try and implement that. Any questions? If there are any questions, we will discuss at this stage. Otherwise, I'll go ahead with the next case. Is there anything on chat box? No, nothing right now. Nothing? Anyone has any questions? Uh, sorry, sir, I could join a little bit late, but late in joining. Uh, yeah. Can you please elaborate on the non tuberculous mycobacteria once again? That is okay. one idea, very unknown, and it's sort of a bizarre. Do face mycobacterium and then mycobacterium non tuberculous, or talk a little bit more on that, sir. Very, very little information okay. on it. Okay, okay, okay. Aditya? So, non tuberculous mycobacteria get classified under the mycobacterium uh, class, but they behave very differently compared to tuberculosis, standard mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, one, they are associated with generally, uh, they, their source comes from water. So poorly autoclaved arthroscopes, uh, injections using uh, local anesthetic bottles which have been opened and cleaned with perlium or saline bottles. Those are the routine sources of infection. So anything with an implant with a chronic low-grade infection, non-tuberculous mycobacteria must be kept in mind. That's the clinical aspect of it, especially after arthroscopies or whenever we use suture materials which are non-absorbable or any arthrograms or basically interventional procedures. They're more also seen with cardiac stents. So it's basically things which stay inside the body and they cause a low-grade infection because of lack of sterility. Uh, as far as the microbiology is concerned, they come into two main types, rapidly growing, slow growing. There are also photochromogens and so, uh, photochromogens, which come under the slow growing. But by and large, in orthopedics, what we see is the rapidly growing NTM. 
Now, as far as antibiotics are concerned, uh, sorry, before antibiotics, for them to be cultured, the rapidly growing take about roughly 15 days to culture. The slow growing take up to six weeks, like in this case. So what we must communicate to the microbiologist or the, the lab where you sent your samples is that you're suspecting NTM. Like I said, those clinical scenarios where we suspect NTM, inform them to keep the culture medium for an extended period. Generally, the culture medium, if there is no growth, is discarded by the fourth or fifth day. Nothing is kept beyond that. But in these cases, if we inform them, they do keep it for an extended period. There are certain special tests with which they can identify these non tuberculous mycobacteria. Now, coming to the treatment part, standard AKT does not work on NTM, whether rapidly growing, especially on rapidly growing. So they do not work. In the slow growing NTM, like in this case, uh, rifampicin, isoniazid can work. But in the rapidly growing, the treatment is completely different. It, uh, amicacin, uh, trimethoprim, sulfamifaxazol, uh, clof uh, uh, clofazamine, uh, there was uh, doxycycline and linozolid. So these are the four or five main antibiotics. Again, for rapidly growing NTM, because they are rapidly growing, the antibiotic sensitivity can be uh, uh, assessed. And based on that, we can decide which antibiotics to be given. The antibiotic duration is at least six months. So again, involvement of the physician is very important because initially amicacin is given and then linozolid and clarithromycin can be continued for a long time. Amicacin itself is nephrotoxic. nephrotoxic. Linozolid can cause significant pancytopenia. So doing a CBC every 10 to 15 days becomes extremely important because suddenly you will see not just the WBC go down, like in a viral infection, we see WBC go down, even the platelets go down. So that's a hint that linozolid toxicity is happening. Another important toxicity side effect of linozolid is peripheral neuropathy. Dr. Aisha I touched on it. It's an extremely uh, uncomfortable feeling for the patient to have young patients burning sensation, there's no treatment for it. It's give it a few months time and it automatically resolves. Sometimes it can take up to six to eight months. So these are the common uh, pointers as far as NTM are concerned clinically and microbiology. Is there anything else, uh, Dr. Suranjan, where which you, which you would want to know? No, no Dr. Aditya, I think you have, you have elaborated quite well. I have to go back and, to my sketchboards once again, my notes, and then I'll come back and, with further questions. Okay. Yeah. There's one thing which I forgot. Yes. We'll Sorry. share Sorry. our paper published in Indian Journal of Orthopedics on NTM. And the important part which I forgot to mention was the histopathology shows a granuloma. So histopathology would show would be the same as far as NTM is concerned or standard TB. Right, that makes it even more confusing. And, and, and so the that's exactly where the clinical, clinical yeah. hints are more important. So if it's an arthroscopy or an MR arthrogram with a histopathology showing granulomas, but gene expert negative. So if the gene expert is negative, that means it's not standard TB. NTM mm. will never be gene expert positive. So that's another clue to identify NTM. Right, right, right. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Coming to the next case, becomes still more challenging when you have a dislocation with fracture. For example, this elderly person presented with persistent purulent discharge. You can see there is a, already an incision line. You can see that ulna is definitely osteomyelitic. Head radius is dislocated. And there is a purulent discharge. Before he presented, four months prior to that, he had an open montagia. There was a small puncture wound as per the patient and the surgeon. He was operated on day two. The head radius is reduced at that time. Three and a half weeks down the line, he developed perillant discharge. Antibiotics started. The discharge stopped for a few days. Antibiotics were continued. But then now you can see there is an osteolytic area. And that is highly suggestive of infection. So the surgeon removed the plate. This is immediately post-op. He has put in the, those stimulant beads. and But the discharge persisted. So he presented to us with head radius. Uh, 
Dr. Aisha has suggested that we wait for some time because such discharge is known with stimulant. Am I right, Aisha? Yes, sir. Yeah. So you need to differentiate between a classic stimulant discharge and perillant discharge. With stimulant, the, the discharge is generally absolutely serious. Here, it was definitely perillant. Number two, we needed to address the dislocated head radius. And as I said, since the discharge was perillant, we had to go in. If it is serious, you can wait. So what are the special issues in this? We have a Montagia fracture dislocation. Head radius has to be repositioned and maintained. We have to maintain the ulnar length. Therefore, the final fixation has to be generally plating. We need to address the bone defect. He's elderly, he's diabetic, and in spite of removal of implant, the infection has persisted. So all these are very challenging. Again, we go back to this, anticipate location of biofilm, think how you can remove it. So the idea is, if it is infected, the incision site is also infected. So excise the entire incision. Here you can see that's the removed skin with stimulan and you can see this area has dirty granulation tissue. So start excising that dirty periosteum with tissue. You can see this membrane. It's part of it is periosteum and the dirty biofilm is absolutely stuck to that. So you start excising that. After removal also, you can see the fracture site is exposed here, which contains granulation tissue. This is that membrane that is removed. And now deep inside, you can see that's the fracture site with definitely infected tissue. Infected granulation tissue at fracture site. So you cannot afford to wait when there is distinct perillant discharge. At this stage, debridement, you need to follow some protocols for debridement. You need to remove the medullary infection. So first and foremost, remove the necrotic bone, remove the granulation tissue here, and then start removing dirty tissue from both the segments. Now, if you put a large scoop, it is very likely that the infection would be pushed inside. So put in the narrow scoop here. Can you see I put in a narrow scoop and from here dirty granulation tissue has come out. So take out, put narrow scoop inside, small scoop inside and try and clean as much as possible. Here you can see I have removed the tissue. Then similar thing is done on the other side, proximal fragment. And now you can see a reasonably clean area, but a large bone defect. A large, large window there has been made because that bone was absolutely flimsy and necrotic. There is no harm in taking out whatever you want. But get rid of infection. Have source control. And then try and develop tissues. Here, we put in VAC. We used a wound contact layer or a, a paraffin gauze and used VAC. Naturally, the head radius got dislocated because uh, there is no support of the ulna. He was on antibiotics for a very long time and therefore the culture didn't grow. So the uh, surgeon, sorry, the ID people started on to press in tesovactam. And you can see a pretty clean wound. We have an absolutely clean wound, large defect. So we put in antibiotic pharma beads there because we have to come back. Here there is no point in putting stimulant. So we put in 
beads and then after 6 weeks we took out all that put in a plate with a again bone cement at the fracture site but now the head radius is reduced at 2 months unfortunately you can see the plate is exposed there was no evidence of infection patient was very comfortable now it was a very difficult decision to make do i take out the plate or we keep the plate if you are the surgeon then it becomes still more difficult now i kept on pressing and pressing there was no infection at all so by 5 months he has he has exposed implant but pretty good movements no evidence of infection started doing all all activities that 7 months fracture has healed very good movements 18 months excellent range of movements and fracture is completely healed it's almost 30 months now because of covid he has not been coming he is doing everything he has uh, just covers it with a sterile gauze and he does everything now yes it was a very controversial decision but fractures are known to heal implants are known to remain uninfected in spite of being exposed well described in literature and you obviously you need to supervise very very carefully the why did this happen i did not plan for a plan see i had done an extensive excision especially when you start moving the elbow the skin certainly stretches and that is why the implant got exposed i should have planned for a flap of at about when i was doing a plate that was a downside any questions now Any questions? Sir, yeah, yeah, Dokash. Sir, uh, at the first instance when we go for debridement uh, for purulan discharge, uh, regarding the mode of fixation, sir, can we not put uh, put in a tens nail uh, to alna after debridement, and uh, or a masculine technique uh, after debridement and uh, just go for uh, fixation of the radial head with keywords. Mm -hmm. couple of things one is tens with that large defect are not going to be stable number 2 is you fix the radial head with k wires that means you are planning to put from humerus to radius am i right yes sir correct humerus to radius now that has been there have been several papers related to that and with my personal experience also that k wire is known to break with slightest movement there would be fatigue failure of that k wire and if that happens you are in big trouble so especially in this case maintaining ulnar length was important as i said i made a mistake of not doing a flap but otherwise you must have a very stable fixation and i did use masculine with plate i put in a cement block again and you uh, change it over to bone grafting at 6 weeks so yes masculine was done but tens i felt will not give adequate support and maintain the length of ulna here maintaining length of ulna was vitally important with tens there would be a collapse if that collapses then the head radius would slip and as far as possible avoid putting in wire from humerus to radius head radius if it breaks the the wire in the head radius goes in and you will never be able to take it out and especially in an infected scenario if that gets infected you are in big trouble sir and also in the second setting after the masculine technique uh, after 6 weeks uh, can we go for uh, uh, ic uh, iliac crest bone grafting and uh, a mini x fix and mini x fix uh, fixation for uh, uh 
maybe maybe the proximal fragment was very small i'll just show you again can you see the proximal fragment with a large defect here with that kind of defect fixator one day or the other is going to fail but yes i mean that was another option agreed agreed i mean i don't say no but keeping external fixator for such a long time would would be difficult because this graft would take a very long time to consolidate in presence of that defect so i agree could have been done but i at that time i felt a plate would possibly give a maintain the length and head radius thank you sir see this can you see the proximal fragment that's really yes. small and with that large defect the in instability was a distinct possibility so can i make a comment sir yeah yeah go ahead uh, uh did you consider uh, transfer bone transport on an lrs again keeping external fixator near the elbow yeah it is difficult it's not very easy i i have tried on pediatric patients uh, i've done one on pediatric patient and uh, with excellent result uh, it was not infection it was basically a club end but uh, uh, it gave, gave very good result very good result yeah. in an infected scenario diabetic with a small proximal fragment hmm. anything is going to be challenging agree yeah. Agreed. Finally, uh, like doing one thing instead of other. I am not justifying what I did. In fact, I am telling you that I should have used a flap. Mm -hmm. But as regards internal fixation is concerned, somehow I felt that the wound appeared very clean, <coughs> and mm -hmm. I felt that maintaining length of ulna is absolutely vital. Oh yes. And keeping external fixator in a diabetic with a small proximal fragment with a large bone defect would have been very troublesome yeah true true sir. so i just run through this case i mean there is no point in discussing this yeah lastly when you have removed the implant and the infection has persisted like this man he had a sinus on the posterior side you can see there are many incisions one is here second is here there is something here and a discharging sinus here so four years prior to presentation he had an intertrochanteric fracture he was treated with pfn he developed infection at one year two years later uh, sorry uh, Uh, one year after that his nail was removed but the sinus was persistent that means he came to us 3 years after the sinus there was no abnormal signal in the hip on mri but all the signal was essentially distal here and this is where we are he has a discharging sinus here and that's a tract and that's the abnormal signal so you need to plan it well your incision has to be planned it is bound to be a typical because there are two or three incisions ideally all old scars need to come out because there could be some infection lurking there sinus of course has to come out drain sites has to come out therefore it would become a very very odd incision then we need to ream the shaft and head and neck is not to be addressed because there was definitely there were no definite no signals in the head and neck so that's the planning you can see that's one scar that's another scar and that the sinus so we decided to excise both the scars and include the sinus 
and felt that that was the most important thing because everywhere there were uh, infected granulation tissue and then you can see the, the pus coming out so appropriate reaming was done window was made reaming was done and this is him at 8 months so the most important thing in this was planning the incision most important and here you can see the scar which has become thing like t and that's the x ray at 8 months so planning incision is absolutely vital lastly this is a 70 year old man, uh, woman she had a persistent discharging sinus after removal of proximal humerus plate so funny thing about this was she had a proximal humerus fracture she was appropriately treated by proximal humerus plate she united there was some difficulty in abduction therefore the surgeon excised uh, sorry decided to remove the plate he removed the plate there was no infection at that time again there was no infection when he removed the plate she presented to us at about 2 months there is a firm hard swelling in biceps no tenderness over fracture site decent range of movement you can see the swelling is way below here that the scar and that's the mri which shows hypoechoic uh, not hypoechoic the uh, altered marrow there can anyone guess she had no infection when plate was removed there was a firm swelling there was a discharging sinus and firm swelling over biceps about a few centimeters below the incision no tenderness over fracture site decent range of movement of shoulder can you think of something so can it be uh, extra bone like myositis uh... yes one possibility but generally myositis would not occur in biceps independent like this was a hard swelling in biceps mobile but yes one has to keep myositis in mind the x ray didn't show any what any was any fnac done sir no no i mean age is uh, what was her age 60 plus 70 70 elderly 70 so whenever these are you know this funny thing initially there was no infection later on there is infection the infection is essentially just distal to this area it is in the muscle mobile hard swelling mobile think of foreign body can you see this gauze piece is that visible couldn't have imagined sir couldn't have imagined right? so always think of this is something odd this is something odd a person should not get infected after implant removal person should not have a swelling which is hard swelling which is mobile generally no symptoms good range of movement no nothing suggestive of active infection in the original fracture site so uh, think of these odd things foreign bodies foreign bodies could be either a gauze piece could be a, a a smaller thing would be a needle very often the needle breaks and cause uh this thing or a part of screw can break and go there so think of such odd things even part of the drain sir if there is given one yes suction drain so this is suction drain suction drain very common this is her at 6 months very comfortable so if infection persist of in spite of implant removal have take good history good clinical examination interpret properly interpret imaging properly best to personally discuss with imaging consultants think of these foreign bodies 
or loose bodies. Keep these foreign bodies in mind, drains, gas pieces, so on and so forth. Many foreign bodies are not picked up on imaging. Remember that. If fracture is not united, then situation is still more troublesome. But the final aim, as we have been saying again and again and again, till we bore you to death, is close, achieve close, uninfected envelope. Yeah. Any questions while Dr. Aditya shares his screen? I think we can go ahead. I'll go ahead. Okay. So this is one more case which presented two years after a PFN nailing for right eye to fracture. Fracture it completely united. You can clearly see on the X-ray. There are two circular viruses, uh, wires, probably uh, this was a subtrop with IT. So to hold the reduction, these circular wires were used and then the nail was passed. So a nice big discharging sinus along the uh, previous surgical scar and patient was walking comfortably. So there were no issues as far as fracture healing was concerned. The patient was hypertensive but non-diabetic, overall very healthy. It was two years since the primary fixation but the pain and swelling had started in the last two months. There was nothing before that. And the discharging sinus for the last one month and had taken antibiotics for three weeks. But the infection persisted and this is how he came to us. We planned for an implant removal. I mean, the thinking was clear. We removed the implant. We uh, reamed the medullary canal because this is a medullary infection. Dr. Yeah, Dr. Menon, yes, just wait. Ask them what they would do. Okay. So we'll open it up for a discussion here. Yes. The challenge will be the SS wires. The challenge will right. be the SS wires. The circular wires will be a great challenge to take out. Absolutely. Anything right. else? And uh, approximately, even after it's though, uh, what was the duration, sir, from the fracture? Two years. Two years. Okay, right. That's a safe window, actually. Otherwise, if it's a closer window, even one year or one and a half, there will be doubt about the union of the fracture. Even though radiologically it might look united, on table after removal of the implant, it might not be so. The picture may be different. So then you ought to have a plan B or C for that. I would think in those lines. A definite removal of all the implant and, and, and the whole works. You, you, you don't do anything short of the whole works. And that, that much I can say as of now. Anything else? Anything else? <coughs> Sir, on removal of the implant, uh, 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 a new de novo fracture may also ensue at times. Correct, correct. You must right. instruct the uh, inform the patient that that can happen. Yeah, Anything that's else? What, that's what I was saying. Yeah. Uh, uh, implant. We, yeah. Like implant breakage issues and uh, that. Okay. That Doctor yeah. Aisha, you were saying something? Yes, sir. I said uh, implant uh, breakage and retention uh, might be an issue. Right, that, that could be an issue. Implant right. removal because the implant is broken and you cannot see it on the x-ray. Yeah, that has happened with me. Yeah. Correct. Correct. The broken Correct. screw, the interlocking screw distally might be broken and possibly one is, I'm not very sure. Maybe the one which is next to the distal one. The proximal interlocking. Absolutely Maybe, right. I don't know. That, that looks a yeah. little different odd. Absolutely. So you need to think of all these things. And again, now, Dr. Menon, Discuss yeah. the biofilm part. Right. So one one question that we must keep in mind is how would we clean this infection? The medullary infection. We'll get to that. This was the position of the patient in a floppy lateral position. So we could turn the patient a little more supine or prone, depending on whether we want to go in front or behind the femur. The entire scar and sinus is excised as we've been discussing all along. We go right up to the lateral cortex of the femur, excising the IT band as well, and reach the head screws. These are the cephalic screws we can see here. 
go right up to the screws try and remove it as one big piece this the head end and the foot end is marked we clearly isolated the distal screws and the head screws as well as the nail i think so that must be our first bolt remove everything around the nail don't think of implant removal yet till we are happy with the soft tissue debridement right up to the bone this we could see pus clearly coming out of the one of the of the distal head screw and luckily here the implants were i mean the implants were not broken so everything came out in one piece but still like dr nag said that the wires were still there and they were completely part of it was buried in the bone so that becomes a challenge you will see arm find out areas and then from there nibble off the extra bone which is grown on top of the wires get to the knots and then cut them and remove them now comes the next question again one more comment i i would i don't know how yeah. much difficult it was you know uh, when you are removing the distal two screws if they are loose one screw has to be kept in place before you put in the jig Correct. to remove the nail otherwise once that is gone it is uh, hell of hell hell breaks loose sort of yes absolutely that's another point to keep in mind while removing this perfect Correct. perfect so if we, just in case we forget to do it i mean we can try and find this screw hole again and put a thick k wire but try and avoid any of those tricks yeah. unless we, we we have to deal with it Mm. so we we are at this stage uh, we remove the nail we remove the screws we remove the wires what next how would we should we close it now or should we do something more uh, anyone can give their opinion unmute and suggest how we should go ahead at this stage the debridement of the bone curettage of uh, the cavity and uh, irrigation how how if you could describe how would you want to so this is very your uh, surgeon you remove the plates what which are the areas you would want to clean and what instrumentation would you want to keep on your ot table the so idea is not a right or wrong the idea is to stimulate the thought process as to how you will go ahead So we uh, use solid reamers to ream the medullary canal. Perfect. And approximately we can use so drill bits to for the proximal uh, for the blades. Correct. Dr drill bits, as in? Uh, yes, sir. Drill bits like four mm or because uh, uh, the proper size uh, reamers may not be available for uh, the blade uh, entry points. like blade insertion points in the head and uh, neck sir so one thing is we must try and avoid reamers in the head what we can do is those tracks are made by the screw holes we can use long scoops and actually scrape out the uh, yes, sir, right we can reach right up to the head right to the tip of the screw where they reach in the subcondyl portion of the head and we can confirm this under c arm in lateral position so using a scoop would be safer than using a, a reamer that would be too risky yes With the scoop, you may will be able to get all the tissue out. I can see you have made a distal window. That is the most appropriate thing to do. Obviously, the picture is sort of saying for itself. I <laughs> learned from this course. So that <laughs> distal window. Thanks, Doctor Menon and Doctor Gas. <laughs> or else, I would. I, I was I was hoping nobody sees that picture. <laughs> Then I, it's, it's quite obvious. Anyway, so that distal window and uh, reamers. I I don't know whether. i would rather make a window nicely uh, shove in a tube there let the whole water flow out that way and probably start with the flexible reamer proximally use a flexible reamer because straight reamers then again certain situations straight reamer is more useful than the flexible reamer but whether to right. do it from the make a separate window at the two uh, interlocking sites or use the proximal uh, entry point as my reaming point would be a decision on the table as to what sort of tissue i'm seeing so like like you correctly suggested a dis the distal two screw holes were combined to make a nice oval window like dr aisha correctly suggested we must ream so the issue is the minute we ream from proximal the reaming will start from the nail entry point all the biofilm will get accumulated in the distal femur and there is no way for it to come out unless we create a window 
So this window is created, and this will also taken in the consent preoperative view that we will be creating a distal window from which the reaming material will come out. Again, uh, like you correctly suggested, flexible versus straight uh, hand reamers. That's a debatable point. But we generally use flexible reamers for the diaphyses. The issue happens in the metaphyses, proximal and distal. They are too wide for the reamer to actually clean the medullary canal. So this distal window helps in clearing of the distal metaphyses. We use scoops to reach all the, I mean, like we go from 12 o'clock to 12 o'clock, go round the clock distally, medial and lateral condyle, and proximally take a scoop and scrape out the proximal femur up to the, say, proximal third of the femur with a scoop. So again, reamers are ineffective in the proximal and distal areas. But in the diaphyses, there's nothing better than a reamer. So the nail size gives us a clue. So we need to find out preoperatively, if possible, what is the nail size. If not, once we remove the implant, we know what the nail size of the reamer should be at least one size larger. Now that's again a challenge with if, we, if the largest size of nail has been used, say maybe a size 12, 13 is generally the largest reamer that we have. So going above that becomes a challenge. So getting rid of that biofilm is, is always a challenge in medullary infection, but we must try and use the largest reamer size available depending on the patient's uh, femur diameter and make a window disc. So that is the most crucial part as far as uh, medullary reading is concerned. Also keep revision THR set ready because that, that has large, long scoops, very long scoops, which would reach almost distally. But we and were very keen that, you know, making a distal window, this point we wanted to make, you do it once, then you will never ever forget about it. So much dirty granulation tissue comes out from there, you will never forget that. In fact, even when you have used a long nail, don't depend on those screw holes. You must make a window so that all the membrane will come out. With screw holes, it is very, very difficult that all those membranous things will come out. Sir, by yeah, yeah. yeah. doing this, uh, like we said, when we uh, like uh, we have a localized uh, metaphyseal osteomyelitis, and uh, we were advised against uh, reaming the diaphysis. Uh, I mean, reaming the area via using uh, via uh, using reamers entered through the diaphysis. So, in this case, uh, when we are uh, washing the contents away, uh, is it not likely that uh, the uninfected part in the lower part of the femur gets uh, infected though we we are creating a window is it not likely that the osteomyelitic process can spread to the other areas so aisha this is a what type of cernimidar classification this is type 1 isn't it medullary osteomyelitis essentially yes. this is medullary osteomyelitis so you need to take out that biofilm which is inside the medullary canal so therefore, you must ream. Now, once you ream, whatever said and done, that ream thing is going to go down, whatever you do. Even if you give, say, head low, still part of it will be pushed inside. So therefore, rather than keeping it inside, you make a track so that it comes out. When you are dealing with the type 3, osteomyelitis or grade 3 or type 3 osteomyelitis where there is no medullary osteomyelitis but a localized osteomyelitis. You have a cortical defect, you have a medullary osteomyelitis, you have locally there, only that area you have osteomyelitis involving cortex as well as medulla only up to that segment. Then you make a window and don't treat. Okay. You know what I'm trying to say? Uh, I mean, you, have a, you have a medullary cavity which is infected. That needs to be scraped and reamed. But if you have a localized segment with one part of the cortex intact and you have a cloaca, you have weak cortex, and your medullary as well as cortical involvement only there. Then you make a window and scrape. Okay. 
I will, what I will do is I will make a few drawings and put it on the group. In such cases, I've always wondered why don't I have a curved uh, curate at this in the, on the table? I have right. one which is a long one, very fine curate, and I really right. it's a pride. It's it's sort of a beautiful asset using that instrument. But then I always yeah. wonder why don't I have a curved one? Next time I'll get one a curved one. Correct. Right. 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 Now what do we do with this stress rises? Age of the patient, sir? 70? Around 70. Yeah, around 70. Back with stimulant. Uh, if you have a culture preoperatively with the appropriate antibiotics, if not, then with uh, antibiotic of choice would be either vancomycin or ticoplanin. Vancomycin would be better. And uh, keep him non-weight bearing for at least uh, six weeks. Correct. No implant inside. Right. The same same was done in this patient. Simulan was put in. I think these cultures were staffed. So, and MRSA, so vancomycin was mixed with the stimulan and spread across the entire medullary canal. And medially in the soft tissue in uh, pocket as well, where there was infection. We kept non weight bearing initially, maybe just toe touch. 10% with a with a walker and this is the one year x-ray you can see here there is really no lateral wall compare this lateral wall with this Putting, putting in that stimulant so deep is quite a challenge. Uh, how did you do it, Dr. Menon? So we, we, we'll show, we've we got a presentation on local antibiotics, which we'll share next time. We've okay. shown how we can, uh, using an exchange tube or even a guide wire and a reamer, we can push okay. the stimulant across the entire medullary canal. Okay. These are simple things. It doesn't require anything fancy. With our OT instrumentation, we can use it. We'll, we'll elaborate it. In a talk, we're going to have on local antibiotic delivery options. We will get to that. So basically, we use a guide wire, for which is present in most of the OTs, would be useful. Yeah. All right. Right. You can see here. Clearly, bone has started consolidation. So the minute we get rid of infection, even at this age, bone defects can start filling in, and the bone can start consolidating. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Stop sharing. So distal mm -hmm. window is something that is absolutely vital. Whether you are dealing with a short PFN or a long PFN. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes. So, uh, this is, we go to a little more complex case. This is a 50-ish man presented with infection and exposed plate. Can you see this? That's yeah. the exposed plate. That's the incision. That's a flap here. And here you can see a fibula. Right? A proximal yeah. tibia plate. A flap and exposed plate. So going to the history, 2002, he had osteomyelitis for which he was treated with bone graft. He developed osteomyelitis immediately after that, treated with debridement in 2015. The ulcer persisted since many years. And this is how he presented to orthopedic department in 2015. Any suggestions? So, was a biopsy taken? And Absolutely right. What sort of trauma was it in 2002? Absolutely right. Biopsy was taken. This is ulcer for 13 years. 
Mm. And you must do a biopsy. Yeah. It's commercial carcinoma. Right. Commercial carcinoma. Absolutely right. So our oncosurgeon did a PET, which was also showed so many things. That's the tumor. <clears throat> so he excised the entire tumor, plated the tibia, unfortunately got infected. Then he removed the plate and multiple cement spaces were done. And finally, in 2018, live fibula graft with plating tibia and a gastronomous flap was done. Unfortunately, again got infected. He was treated with vac dressing in the proximal portion of the flap where you can see. And infection persisted. So he presented to us at eight weeks. This is where we are. Eight weeks. So the first step, of course, is a good debridement. How many weeks after the fibula grafting, sir? Eight weeks. Eight, eight weeks. weeks. Okay. So the challenges are we have a live fibula, we have a plate, we have a gastro flap, and part of it is skin graft, and we have infection going on for eight weeks. Not eight weeks, actually, uh, uh, more than that, because initially it, he was plated, plate was removed, proximal tibia plate was done. So almost a year or so, this was going on before he presented to us. So from where to lift up the flap was very challenging. So the most challenging thing was Vascular study, sir. Sorry? Vascular study. I would I would ask for a angiography. Yes. It can be, an, I mean, if it is MR compatible, an MR angio would do, or else a conventional angiography is better, actually, to delineate the vessels. And because they, they I mean, they would have put in, because it's a vascularized fibula. So yes. which vessel they have used to do that and how patent that vessel is, whether this fibula is actually having a vascularity or not would decide if the fibula is not vascular, it's two months down the line. It's a dead bone lying over there, causing the, all the trouble. Absolutely right. Thing is, I felt that my first step is good exploration. And then we would do, decide what is to be done. So first step was incision. What would I do? I would go along the flap and lift it up. Not like this, but like this. So excise this area completely, which was adherent and infected. That's a proximal tibia plate exposed. Dirty tissue all along. That's a plate exposed. This is a flap lifted up. That is the gastronomous flap, which was lifted up. So we could open the entire flapped area. That's the dirty granulation tissue inside. And the fibula at that time somehow appeared vascular. Good. Punched it a bit, it was bleeding. Said nothing to be done. And this is post-debridement. He has virus, but a decent sagittal alignment. He did have minimal mobility there. <coughs> and here you can see the fibula is exposed, but reasonably good. That's a flap which is uninfected. The tissues appear clean. Now what do I do? How do I stabilize? How do I get a good skin cover? What do I do with fibula? The fibula is exposed here. Fibula is exposed here. Now this is where VAC helped. Though the fibula was exposed, it was vascular. I could get, uh, we could get a cover distally. Using VAC, you can see the way it improved. That is post first VAC, post second VAC, and then this was absolutely fit for a split thickness. Yeah. 
axis him but he fractured now what do i do now what conservative do I do? conservative sir why do you well, think fib slender fibula will help you throughout your life bone <laughs> transplant uh so here uh, uh, since the fibula was vascular and uh, since there is a refracture either there are two possibilities which can be done either you can go ahead with the bone transport with an elizaro or you can just mount a frame uh, over the limb on the in the, with the fibula in situ and ask your patient to do full weight bearing so Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because... there have been several papers yeah about live fibula mm. incidence of such fractures is quite high and every time they fracture they form callus yes sir and there is more chances of healing yes sir so uh, somebody said uh, conservative so conservative yes, conservative conservative yeah. so i guess you can see the fibula has started consolidating consolidating the callus has increased this is at 7 months this is at 14 months we are happy but the fibula is not increased in size size yes sir yes sir yes sir yes sir has not hypertrophied yes sir yes sir so then he gets another fracture yes again continue with the the brace <laughs> that he was wearing this is at 27 months and fibula is hypertrophic hypertrophic he has harus but he just not keen on getting anything done he, you can yes. see the fibula is really consolidated consolidated it's almost like size. the tibia almost like the tibia and a very very comfortable patient so we started here that's the live fibula we really were not sure whether that fibula is going to survive but it appeared vascular on table so i was not keen on taking it out because you know man has suffered from 2002 and it was already 16 years down the line and i thought if i could salvage the fibula this fibula then nothing like it vac really helped to get a good cover that fibula could be covered and we could do a split thickness graft just got away with a split thickness graft this was the first fracture that was the time when we read about this live fibula getting fractured getting hypertrophied and on an average the most of the papers say that on an average people get 2 to 2.5 fractures like this and they hypertrophy this is so microfibula is a high power of fighting infection every attempt is to be made to salvage it and fractures generally lead to more callus and consolidation any questions if there are no questions we will go to the last case nothing on chat box so aditya will go ahead with the last case yeah so the last uh, case for the day another infected non union of the tibia slightly different from the first one 25 year old female came to us one year after the surgery with a small discharging fan and this was the x-ray this was again a segmental fracture placed it fixed with a long plate with a circular wire in between this plate we, we trace the old x-rays on these serial x-rays help us uh, figure out how the consolidation has happened how the implants have either stayed in place or loosened over time lysis can be visualized on serial x-rays kept next to each other so the patient had a proximal bicondylar and distal shaft fracture initially was externally fixed 
uh, fixed with an external fixator. Unfortunately, developed a pin tract infection. So the surgeon promptly removed that and immediately put in a long LCP with screws. Now, after this fixation, the patient developed discharge from the middle third of the shaft. Luckily, by the time the patient presented to us, the proximal fracture had completely united. So the distal part was in an infected non-union. Clearly, no callus there. We went ahead, removed the implant. We did, like we always do, excise the scar, debrided, excise necrotic bone. And this was the x-ray after the debridement. Cultures grew Pseudomonas and Kepsera was given, which was resistant to everything. Thankfully, amikacin was one of the sensitive uh, antibiotics, which was given for six weeks. Fixed with an LRS. And an antibiotic spacer was, like a masculine technique was inserted within the gap for antibiotic delivery. And promptly after a month, iliac crest bone grafting was done. I mean, some surgeons would choose to do bone transport. That is also an option. But here we chose to do masculine followed by iliac crest bone graft. Unfortunately, the graft side and the same non-union side developed a discharging sinus one month after the graft. So we have explored, removed part of the bone graft, which we felt was loose and infected, and we closed it. The culture at this stage grew staphylococcus and again pseudomonas aroma. So here, amic acid with cefazolin was given and then shifted to cephalicin. This is the picture at one year. The fracture had consolidated. Although the reduction in the lateral may not be as ideal as we would want, but we were happy that the infection had subsided. The LRS was removed. But after removing that, the patient came back four months later with severe pain, redness, swelling, at the non-union site, and the patient was not able to walk. We got an X-ray done, which showed a refracture at the same site which had showed consolidation. We put, took the patient up for, in the OT, applied an LRS before we could we, we explored so that the the initial stability allowed us to put in the external fixator. We explored, and Frank first came out. Now let's let's revisit the one-year X-ray. Yes, there was. The alignment was not ideal, but can a malalignment actually cause a recurrence? Un unlikely. The cause of the recurrence was probably that bone graft which got infected. We did a debridement, but removed only part of it. Ideally, we should have been thorough to remove all the bone graft which was loose and practically almost all of it would have come out. Put in another cement spacer and then done a regrafting. That would have been ideal. But since we didn't do that, although the fracture went, to, went on to consolidate, it did have a recurrence at one year after fracture union. So that means there was some infection lingering there, which ultimately led to a pathological fracture with a recurrence of the infection. So we excised again and we're back to square one. You can see the X-rays clearly. We had to excise significant amount of bone which was infected. Culture grew the staphylococcus again, which had grown at the time of the bone graft infection. Antibiotics were given. We put in vancomycin cement beads at this stage. And we decided that we fix her. We've done a thorough debridement, but let's get an alignment at this stage and get an internal fixation rather than trying union and external fixation. So fibula osteotomy was done. An intramedullary rod was inserted. This was three months after the debridement with iliac crest bone graft again. This is six months later. She went on to consolidate. And thankfully, so far, this is a six-year follow-up. There's been no recurrence of infection. So intramedullary infection, uh, intramedullary fixation also has a role. Just because it's an infected non-union does not mean you, we cannot use internal fixation, but we must be uh, sure about our debridement that we've got adequate source control. Use the internal fixation that gives us the ideal alignment even better than an external fixator. And we can end up getting good results in these cases. Can that I is another question. Yeah, sure. Can we go back to the first X-ray when when you saw the patient first after the first yeah. fixed litter, possibly? I'll, I'll do that. Sorry, one second.
this x ray mm. this is not present this is where where she presented na yeah yeah uh, i was wondering whether is there any role of putting in a rush nail in the fibula when you are stabilizing this fracture to get the right alignment yes absolutely yeah. yeah so getting the fibula aligned is one of the most important aspect as far as handling a tibia non union absolutely yeah. right so had we done that on day 1 i mean at least our alignment would have been ideal it does wouldn't have been guaranteed a recurrence of the infection but at least the alignment would have been bang on on day 1 yeah. so this stage like you said when we put the lrs yeah absolutely uh, right. rest is fine possibly agreed agreed right sir excellent cases to see okay now uh, we have about 10 minutes i will just share the case which we had put on the group this young boy met with a vehicular accident and he presented with non union as well as a large sequestrum distally how often have you seen a sequestrum at the end of the bone end of the nail so infection at the end of the nail is not very uncommon you must always be very very careful in watching the end of the nail it you may not have such large sequestrum but you often have a small osteolytic area and that often needs to be addressed so when you are planning to take out the nail either united fracture or ununited fracture at least check clinically whether there is tenderness or radiologically if there is an osteolytic area so i'll just run through this case this is at presentation he had a heel scar he had a flexion deformity you can see an arthrotomy was done so all this i have shared so we removed the nail you can see very large sequestra distally that's the anterior window that we have made that's after deep closure covering the parapetalar incision we put vac at that stage then put a cement bead and closed now question is what kind of internal fixation or external fixation should you do anybody is i mean you will can certainly put an antibiotic nail we decided to put lrs we used non anatomical but stable reduction this is at 2 months he was very comfortable so at that stage that's the range of movement this is at 3 months when we took out the antibiotic beads and put in fibula graft you can see the there is practically no bone here distally it was communicating with the knee that's why he had large knee swelling that's why he had significant synovite is there and within no time he started developing bone there after good debridement here you can see this is at 5 months he started forming bone here this is at 7 months the fracture is united this is when we removed the lrs now you can see the distal femur has formed bone here this is at 18 months pretty good consolidation bone here has also formed the fibula are getting incorporated that's a range of movement almost full flexion and this is at 5 years you can see complete bone formed here distally in the fossa and 
complete formation of medullary canal. So it's not the internal fixation or external fixation. If you can achieve a good stable reduction, then there is no problem. So external fixation will not work if you have a mobility there or if you have too rigid an external fixation. If you use a, something which we have been stressing, a non-anatomical but stable reduction, then external fixation would do well. So don't forget the joint above and below. Take full length x-rays. Culture negative is a challenge, but you can still get good results if you have aggressive debridement, local antibiotic, a good soft tissue cover and stable fixation. So a non-anatomical stable fixation helps if you use an external fixator. Any questions? Otherwise, Dr. I'll request Dr. Thakur to summarize today's discussion. May I ask a question, sir? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So why, why did he choose fibula as a graft there? It was quite a hollow cavity. Uh, yes. Usually that's not the site you put a fibula. What prompted you to do that? There must be a reason why you choose fibula. It was a huge cavity, absolutely huge cavity. Mm -hmm. So I thought we may not have adequate iliac crest graft. Mm -hmm. And I thought we may have a fracture. If you see the cavity was so large, I was mm. actually concerned that it might fracture like this. Mm. So I could punch the fibula and that itself gave very good support. I will just share the screen again. Then you will realize what I'm trying to say. Did you also use cancellous uh, electrocraft? No, 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 no other. I used only fibula, but I punched the fibula. Mm. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. See the size of cavity and practice. Uh, sir, we can't see the presentation. You'll have to un un I mean, unshare your screen and. Okay. <clears throat> Can you see now? Yes, sir. Yes. Large cavity there. Distally, practically, there is nothing. Yeah. So I was really worried that, see this cavity, huge cavity there. I was really worried that it might crumple. It might have a fracture there. What so do I use initially? Fibula as a structural graft. I use what fibula as a structural graft. I'll just show you the fibula now. Now, what are these white beads, sir? I mean, you are using cement? They're cement. They're cement beads. Okay. So here you can see the fibula. There is one transverse fibula, one vertical fibula that gives structural support. Yeah. So we could start weight bearing. Otherwise, I was concerned that with weight bearing, he'll have a distal fracture. Quite likely. And contrary to our thinking that fibula is a cortical bone, it will not consolidate. It consolidates very well. If there is no infection, anything can happen. Fibula can get incorporated quite well. See this. But the essential thing was punching the fibula here and here. One more question, sir. There was an earlier belief. I mean, we used to do it in our PG days to make small holes in the fibula before you're putting in the graft. The belief was that uh, it sort of incorporates and vascularizes more because you're using anyway a dead piece of bone. Correct. Does, correct. That, does that belief still hold? I mean, I've not I, done uh, uh, this. No, I because it will work as a stress riser. Fibula is quite thin. It will work as a stress riser. Yeah. Sir? Yes, please. Sir, um, uh, the we... So can you go to the slide where the scars were present in the first slide of the last case, sir? Last case. So there was a sequestrum in the metaphysis and uh, there was a scar on the anterior medial aspect of the knee. Uh, one minute, one minute. I'll show you the presentation. Right here. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, sir, I could not... Uh, uh, yeah. So he was, 
his sinovectomy was done somewhere else before he presented to us. Okay, sir. And uh, like in case of uh, multiple scars as these, and with presence of uh, metaphyseal osteomyelitis, uh, in absence of a sinus tract, uh, sir, if there was a sinus tract right through this scar, uh, would you have chosen uh, to excise the entire scar? And uh, sir, is there any role of uh, uh, like uh, I had thought that we would be doing a an extended anterolateral incision and thereafter uh, going uh, for debridement and further steps. Another thing is that like we say like uh, in a parapetalar approach, um, the all the blood supply is from the medial side. So uh, any in case of any uh, repeat debridement or repeat, uh, say for case of septic arthritis when you're doing a repeat surgery, you should uh, take the most uh, lateral incision if I'm not wrong, sir. So. Okay. I will answer, answer both these things. One is, if you have already taken an incision, the blood supply there is already less. You take another incision at a distance, then there are more chances that the middle portion will necros. It's all, that is number one. Number two, in an infected scenario, the incision is likely to have infected material. So it is always better to excise that incision and go in. As far as possible, avoid making another incision, as far as possible. So go through the same incision. They, it has already been taken. And number three is generally, there is no point in taking a medial or a lateral incision. There is no problem at all. You can certainly take a medial parapetalar incision. You can take an anterior incision. You can take a lateral incision. Generally, on this on the knee, there is no problem. But if somebody has already made one incision, there is no point in going to have another incision, unless, of course, it is absolutely essential. So, one more question. So, if, if I may add to that, I think, Dr. Aisha, what you were referring was, uh, in standard TKR teachings, they show multiple scars, one medial, one center, one lateral. And you're yes, asked sir. to take the lateral most. That is what I think you were referring to. Yes, sir. So that would apply in a clean case. But here, like sir said, in an infected case, you try and go through the same scar because that scar will have the infection there. Okay, Rather sir. than creating one more new incision lateral to it. So, yeah. one more question. Yeah. Uh, uh, was the distal femur, the femoral condyle is so was so destroyed. What was the ligament status, uh, the laxity of the knee? Surprisingly. Surprisingly. That's what I was talking. Surprisingly. Sort of surprises us as to how nature can heal. And Correct. you expect that all the, you're imagining the anatomy as to where all things have gone wrong. So, somehow it doesn't go wrong. And Generally, we're never worried about instability after infection because the fibrosis is so magical. Yes. Just stabilizes everything. Yes. And provided we get rid of the infection. Yes, truly. So nature, nature's magic. True. Doc, sir, Dr. Thakur. Hello. Yes. I, today I don't have a video, but uh, oh. audio is all right. Are you yes. hearing me? Yes, yes. Yeah, me. Okay. Fine. This evening we started with uh, with identifying infection. When the, immediately after surgery, when infection is likely, the surgeon is re in real trouble and he's really depressed and worried what's going to happen to his case. So to pick up infection at the earliest is the best thing that you can do to the patient. And for that, you don't have to go and wait for the classical signs. The suggestive signs are good enough. And once you follow them, it may be even better to err on the side of opening it up than to sit on it and wait for it to subside or just go on pushing antibiotics. Over and again, these five weeks, we have said early in, in intervention after a suspected infection is the best way for the patient and for the surgeon. Having established that, we then moved on to the importance of radical debridement, stabilization, and, uh, and the skin cover. 
these points were repeatedly enunciated so they are drilled in our memory that always whenever there is infection go for radical debridement check the stabilization if it is present if it's not present create stable thing and go for a good cover that means from the infected cover go to a non infected cover and then move on from there having established these two major points in management of infection after surgery we had a series of wonderful cases the most notable was the non tubercular mycobacterium and the way it was discussed whether the rapid growing and the slow growing and the hazards with the slow growing etc that was very uh, that was very uh, very revealing to me alna cover was again there but many times we have seen that small uh, on a tight areas like fibula or in the alna uh, the exposed plate a small portion of exposed plate can go on and can lead to a union and the plate could be removed after several months or several uh, maybe a couple of years as well the distal femur infection was uh, also very very challenging and was very useful foreign body in biceps after surgery that would be disaster for the surgeon and that is the reason our surgical etiquette should be to count the swabs all the time that point uh, i mean it was bad to see that uh, there was a gauze left inside in the bicep obviously the count the swab count was not done in that theater which is a bad discipline importance of making a distal window when you do a reaming was also very instructive and as dr agasha said that once you see that the buck coming out you will never forget to make a window that window is very good idea and should be done Uh, and one point is the revision hip process instrumentations have got very long scoops and ring uh, curates and things so it's better to borrow from the orthoplastic surgeons and use it in the infection or if you're getting too many of such cases better to have your own set so it can be looked after very well lastly the live fibula demonstration and the courage to keep it up on the hinge on the hitch that the it is it is surviving that will need to pay dividend so sometimes you have to make decisions which are tough but they work very well when they work very well we remember when they don't we we never discuss them again so overall it is a very interesting uh, uh, evening mainly the cases were very very and uh, when we very, very representative of different aspects of management and they would be remembered by everybody when it comes to doing their own things again thank you for the sir. thank you sir thank you thank you sir is there no more questions i think uh, we will call it a day we thank will you, post cases of soft tissue infections next time we will have soft tissue infections that would be followed by tuberculosis and followed by soft tissue cover next week we will not be meeting because we have western india regional conference and uh, we would be meeting week after that so bye bye till then thank you sir bye bye sir bye thank you sir bye good night sir